Hey, how are you doing? So is this the snack of the 1800s? Some cooked corn? Yeah. <laughs> I'd say for the most part it was probably a main meal. <laughs> when you can get it. <laughs> Yeah. It was twenty three New River Rifle, the twenty fourth of January, eighty third, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and so you 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 mean Pennsylvania, what does that mean? It means so we represent a pencil uh, when we put on a Yankee uniform, we oh, okay. represent okay. Yeah, yeah, fight on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a represent both sides, that's what Well not at the same time. We got a, <laughs> yeah. This is our our basically schedule. Uh huh. I mean, we're here. Okay. Living History of Appomattox National Historic Park. Yeah, it's the busy summer, January, isn't it? Or a busy year. And we'll be in Kentland. Well, it's the sesquicentennial. Yeah, I know. Everybody. Everybody. So, it's like every weekend, you know, Floyd County wants us to come over there and do a thing for their kids at school. <laughs> and Radford wants us to come over there. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, the Yankees fired over the river at Radford and tried to tear up a bunch of the bridges mm -hmm. there. And they want us over there. And, uh. So when you say here reenactment, does that mean battles? Yeah, that and then living history is not. Yeah, living history is just what we're doing now. There's uh -huh. a, but we're you were tickled to death. When I first got into the hobby back in the seventies, uh, the authentic stuff was not nearly as available as it is now, mm -hmm. and a lot of times people had to end up making their own stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, but uh, they research uniforms, materials. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're pretty well dressed for a Confederate, though, aren't you? Well, I'm an officer. Oh, so well, what do those bars mean? <laughs> That's a cap. Okay. If my, if my, uh, if the, the, so the three, 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 one would be a, uh, what is it, a second lieutenant, uh -huh. two bars would be a first lieutenant, three bars would be a captain, one star would be a major, three stars would be, uh, two stars and three stars would be variations of colonel, I don't know. Lieutenant Colonel, or mm -hmm. uh, uh, and if you three stars with a wreath around mm -hmm. it, it would be a general. Okay. So, yeah. wow. so one star is a major, and then two, three stars would be uh, colonel, various levels of colonelcies, and then uh, 
the, if you put a wreath around the uh, stars. And yeah, I know they have reenactors that do the grand. And they routinely travel around or just. Stay? Yeah, there are there are there are people who impersonate. Uh, they, we, there's a uh, Jubal Early that's down in uh, Franklin County. Uh, there's a couple of Lees. I guess we'll see them there. here Lincoln, in what 2015. Do they brilliant. go? Up, do they go around during your mm -hmm. season? But they, they have their they have their. Their hoods, their territory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They don't travel to all of them and everywhere. But, uh, so the 150th, we should see the Lee and yeah. Grant. Yeah, they'll be, they'll be, well, well, it depends on where. Grant was at Vicksburg. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Surrender is yeah. 2015. Well, now well, here, yeah, here. if they do a surrender here, they should be. The yeah. Surrenders came from over here. This is, this. there's a little triangle. The road makes a triangle right there, and that's called the surrender triangle. They marched in this direction because they're trying to get to Lynchburg, which mm -hmm. is that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. And the Yankees, if you go down where the North Carolina Monument and mm -hmm. all that is, that's where that Lee tried to break through. Mm -hmm. The Yankee cavalry came up and blocked the road because Lee's coming this way trying to get to Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. Yankee cavalry came up and blocked the road. He ordered the, his infantry to attack, mm -hmm. to break through the Yankee cavalry to resume the retreat to Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, after much, some fighting, not a whole lot, but after some fighting, he was able to to part the Yankee cavalry. And by the time by the time he did that, behind him was just long lines of mm -hmm. federal infantry. And he yeah. Made, you know, Yankees to the south, Yankees to the east, and of mm -hmm. course Grant, the main Union army, was trailing him over here to the east and to the west and to the south. Mm -hmm. and there was nowhere to go. But that cavalry. Some of his cavalry did take off that way. Mm -hmm. I remember his his nephew Fitzhugh Lee. Mm -hmm. I was in command. There was another cavalry commander named Carlson. He was on the hillside back there, and they were watching over on the north flank where there was no real action. And Carlson was sitting on his horse and wondering what the heck was going on. And Fitz Lee came riding up the hill, and Carlson says, "What's going on down there?" And he says, "Uncle Bobby's getting ready to surrender. Our army. Let's get mm -hmm. the hell out of here." <laughs> and they did. Uh, Carlson skirted, the, but cavalry, he could do that. He skirted the. The Yankee lines around to the mm -hmm. north and, and made it to Lynchburg. Mm -hmm. so Lynchburg, the, the war was in effect. He just padded his way. It's so hard to imagine. So when you, I know you talk about stacking the arms. How many troops are we talking about for each side about here? About Thirty thousand. And then uh, the Yankees had about oh I don't know between eighty and hundred. So they stacked the arms right over here. Well, so right uh, well, this, right uh -huh. road here, they and what did that mean? Did that mean they that just and it, they never could take their yeah, rifles yeah. back? I mean, they just okay. I didn't know because yeah, I thought I heard. Could keep their side arms, okay. Their pistols, because you know, even in World War II, okay, it was a sign of respect. Lee never surrendered his sword. Lee, Grant never asked for it. And Lee never offered it. It just it never well, came up. Yeah. Lee, it, is that the authentic sword in the? It's at museum? the Museum of the Confederacy. Yeah, but hmm. uh, but that is that is actually. Yeah, but they would they. Uh, they stacked their weapons. They took off their traps, the, the cartridge box, and the, the, then all they were that free stuff. to go. Really. And then, yeah, they were basically free to go. Yeah. As long as they, they took the we got the paroles here, uh -huh. which means they're a paroled officer. They can't take up arms against the United States again until they're duly exchanged. And as long as they don't take up arms against you yeah. know, the United States, they're they're free, free to live home unmolested. Now, if they were officer. Uh, Basically, the, they had to take an oath of allegiance in order to get their citizenship back. They were uh -huh. basically non-citizens. Mm -hmm. So they were free to go home, but they couldn't vote, hold office, and do any of that sort of thing until they had actually taken an oath of allegiance. Oh, okay. So most of them did. Some of them did. <laughs> there was yeah. a story. <laughs> there was a, there's an old man in... Uh, they do that at the courthouse about once a week. A federal official would show up at the local county courthouses, and they'd gather, you know, 20 or 30 of these old rebels would gather and take the oath. And, Sort of hey, Mike. I can see you. Hey, how you doing? And, uh, Are you good, good? This federal officer was saying, all right, man, I want you all to raise your right hand. This old one confederate chewing tobacco spit said, well, we sure whooped them Yankees at Chickamauga, didn't we? He said, shut up now. That war's over. It's time to take oath. Raise your hand. Yeah, but you know we whooped you at Chickamauga, didn't we? He said, boy, shut up. We're going to do the oath now. The war's over. Yeah, but he, he knows, he knows we've hooked them at check them off. If you don't shut up, you know. Uh -huh. He said, all right, I'm sorry, sir. I said, raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. You swear, blah, 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 blah. The Constitution, he says, I do. He says, I said, Captain, said, I'm now, I've done taking the oath. He said, yeah, I'm now a loyal United States citizen. Yeah, I'm not a rebel anymore. He says, you know them rebels sure whooped our ass at Chickamauga, didn't they? <laughs>
minutes and uh, welcome you all to uh, Appomattox Park. Uh, you all obviously know what happened here uh, over 100 years ago uh, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, elements of the 11th Virginia and the 24th Virginia. They were two regiments who were raised in uh, the Lynchburg, Montgomery County, Franklin County, uh, Carroll County areas of uh, western and southwestern Virginia. They, both regiments were members of Kemper's Brigade, Pickett's Division, and Longstreet's Corps, and both actually participated in the famous Pickett's Charge at, uh, at Gettysburg. Uh, they're commanded by Captain Thomas Parkinson of uh, Lynchburg, a, a long veteran of the, uh, of the hobby. And now, if, you, if you're Permission, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Johnny Reb. This strapping, fine looking young man, I'll introduce you to him, is Mr. Johnny Private Johnny Reb. He's between 18 and 22 years old. Uh, he's probably never been more than 25 miles away from his home in his life until the Civil War came along. Uh, he's not even living. Letters are not his strong suit. He can make himself understood with the pencil and the paper, but it, it takes a little deciphering to figure out exactly what he's trying to say. He wears a hodgepodge uniform typical of a rebel army. Some of it he got from home, some of it uh, was government issued to him, and of course some of it he picked up off a battlefield. He wears the typical uh, Civil War boot of the period, the brogan shoes, the soles or leather soles held together with wooden pegs. The tops are basically stitched leather. His uniform is something called jean cloth, which is a twill of cotton and wool uh, put together, which was very common in the South. Uh, most of the Southern uniforms at the beginning of the war uh, were gray in color, and of course you all know the, the blue and the gray, and the gray being the traditional color of the Confederacy. But short of resources and blockaded by the Yankee Army, gray dye soon ran out in the South. And being Southerners, they had to improvise and began dyeing their fabrics with a brown dye, which they made from tree bark and pecan and walnut shells. And this produced a kind of a brownish dye, giving the color of a butternut to the uniforms. So his jacket is a Southern jacket but it's dyed butternut, and a lot of the southern soldiers were called butternuts because of this brown color. It comes from the brown bark and uh, nut shells that they used for dyeing. It's cut off short at the bottom. It's called a shell jacket because, again, textile shortages in the south 
you couldn't make the long, my jacket was imported from England, but most of the jackets in the South had to be cut off short because of textile shortages. His equipment consists first of a leather cartridge box, which he wears on his right hip, carrying the standard load of 40 rounds for a Springfield. If he were carrying a Springfield, the infield cartridge box would hold 50, and that's what they were traditionally given as a standard load for an infantry soldier to carry. Above his right hip also is the cap box, which is part of the ignition system for the gun to make it work. On his left hip, of course, is his uh, bayonet, which he could use for hand-to-hand -hand fighting if he so ordered, but most soldiers hated to fight at that close range. They'd much prefer to shoot at each other with a musket than to actually engage in hand-to-hand -hand with a bayonet. So the bayonet more often was used uh, at night as a candlestick holder to, uh, to uh, cook meat on and stuff. They'd skewer a piece of side meat or something like that to hold over the fire to cook it with. Uh, tent steak was also a handy use for a bayonet, but uh, if he had to fight with one, he could. Some Confederate generals like Stonewall Jackson were extremely fond of the bayonet, uh, but the, most of the typical soldiers were not, and some would actually throw the thing away rather than be ordered to charge into a, a bayonet charge. On his right hip, he carries what's called a haversack. Most Confederate haversacks were usually just uh, white ca uh, canvas sacks, and in that he would carry his rations. He would carry his hardtack, uh, salt pork, uh, <laughs> goober peas, uh, whatever he could scrounge, apples, corn, uh, sweet potatoes, whatever he could scrounge on the march and that sort of thing. Obviously on the inside of that uh, haversack was very nasty, very dirty, very greasy, but that's what he had to carry his, his rations in. Uh, most Yankee haversacks were a black tarred uh, haversack which made them waterproof and a lot more durable and on a lot of the Confederates you may see a few black haversacks among the Confederates over here, which obviously came from being picked up on the battlefield. Uh, he would carry his personal items, rather than put his papers, his extra clothing and stuff like that in his haversack, he would wrap it up in his bedroll. The soldiers would take their blanket, roll it up like a donut, and wear it over their shoulder. And inside, besides a blanket to sleep on at night, inside this blanket roll, he would also have, if he was lucky enough to have, extra socks, maybe an extra shirt, any private papers, a diary if he happened to keep one, anything like that he wanted to protect from the, uh, the greasy, nasty insides of the, the food bag he's carrying. Uh, he's wearing a French kepi, which was uh, somewhat popular in the South for those soldiers who uh, wanted that jaunty, rakish look of the French kepi. The French were considered the ideal. At the time of the Civil War, the French were considered the uh, epitome of military prowess. Napoleon, of course, even though he'd lost to the English, was still looked on as the, uh, the military genius of the age and anything French. We copied French uniforms, the French kepis, the musket fires a French uh, bu uh, bullet invented by a Frenchman. Uh, you'll notice at the beginning of the war, uh, the Confederate General Beauregard was the Napoleon of the South and, of course, uh, McClellan being the Napoleon of the North, so uh, everything French was, was considered, if it was French, it was cool. And so he's wearing the French-inspired uh, kepi, but most Confederate soldiers, if you'll look in the ranks over there, preferred the floppy hat. Uh, the broad brim protects you from the sun, you can ball it up at night and sleep on it for a pillow, and uh, uh, for practicality, you got the, the floppy hat for the style and genre of a, of a well-dressed Confederate soldier, you've got the uh, you've got the cappy. He's carrying an English infield musket. This thing was he probably acquired this even at the beginning of the war from arsenals, which uh, United States arsenals, which had large supplies of these, uh, taken over by the South when the Southern states seceded, or it could have uh, acquired it through the blockade uh, during the Civil War. The British government would ship. Uh, thousands of these things to their uh, bases in the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, southern blockade runners, uh, low, sleek, uh, fast-moving ships would sneak through the Yankee blockade from ports like Wilmington and Charleston, uh, Jacksonville, to the islands of the Caribbean where they'd trade uh, cargoes of cotton, tobacco, for infield muskets. Then again, waiting for the dark of the moon to slip back through the, uh, the Yankee blockade and bring back muskets, textile items, medicine, 
anything that the south was basically short of. These things are as long as they are, number one, for accuracy, and for number two, the soldiers <coughs> fought in two lines like this, and the rear rank had to extend the muzzle of the musket past the ear of the guy in front of him. A short musket could cause serious harm to the, uh, the front rank man's ear, so the long musket would extend out over the shoulder of the man in the front rank and thus uh, save him from any serious damage. It took about nine <coughs> steps, separate steps, to load that thing. Uh, and most good soldiers could get off about three rounds per minute. There were numerous ways of firing it, which Captain Tarkenton will, uh, and his company will uh, demonstrate in just a minute. Uh, does anybody have any questions right off hand? Okay, uh, Private uh, Reb, if you'll uh, return to the ranks. There are numerous ways of delivering fire. The Civil War soldiers fought in clumps of a hundred, which a hundred men would make, eighty to a hundred men would make up a company, and usually eight to ten companies would make up a regiment. So you'd have a regiment consisting of anywhere from eight hundred to a thousand men. The best way to defeat the enemy was to hit them with massed gunfire. And the only way you can mass your gunfire is to mass your men. That's why they fought shoulder to shoulder in ranks like that in order to deliver the most devastating blows to the enemy that they possibly could. These were regimental volleys. And they were the most they were the most often used during the during the battle. It's not the only way you can deliver fire on, into the enemy ranks, but it was the most effective. This will Captain. be loud, folks, so be aware of that. Uh, if you want to cover your ears, you can either put palms over them or put your fingers in your ears. Uh, we recommend doing that just for a little bit of hearing protection. Also, if you have children or if you any all have any dogs, be aware that that might startle them. Guns go boom. Guns go boom. It's not going to be like that cannon we saw that time. I know. Sacrifice a little in volume for a more sustained fire by firing by ranks. <laughs> you would have the rear rank fire while the front rank held their fire. Then while the rear rank loads, the front rank would fire. The advantages of this, what you said, you sacrifice in volume, you're only getting about half the firepower of a full company, but you're getting a more steady fire. Fire by rank! Fire by rank! Rear rank! Aim! Now, while the rear rank is loading, the front rank's guns are already loaded, so they serve as a protection of the unit. And as soon as the rear rank muskets are loaded, then the front rank will fire. So you're getting twice the rate of fire, but half the volume. And you've always got loaded muskets. The trouble with a, a regimental volley is you empty all the muskets at once. So for 20 seconds while you're reloading, you're basically defenseless. This way, you're never defenseless. Now, while the front rank is loaded, they're protected by the rear rank guns, which are loaded. You'll notice the soldier in the front rank on the end, rather than return his ramrod to the pipes in his musket, he just jabs the thing down in the ground which speeds up his loading considerably. He can load and reload by just driving his uh, ramrod down in the ground rather than trying to put it back into the, uh, the pipes of his musket. Firebox falls from the right. This is right. another way of firing. Fire. 
What they're going to do is they're starting on the right hand side of the line and they're going to fire two soldiers at a time all the way down the line so that you get a bang, 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 bang down the line. Once you've fired, you reload and fire at will. So again, you don't get the volume of fire that you would get with volleys or firing by rank, but you'll get a steady pop, 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 going off constantly. What situations warranted which tactics they would use? Probably at greater distances they would do this. As the distance between the regiments closed, you would probably switch to the massed bodies because that's going to get your most devastating bodies being hit by. Excuse me? What range did they have? These things are deadly between six and 800 yards. Yeah, they're rifled. They're rifled. They're firing what's, what the soldiers call a mini ball. It's not a small ball. It's a, con it's a lead conical bullet, which was invented by a Frenchman named Minet. It's got a hollow in the back, a dimple in the back that sits up where the powder charge is. And when the powder explodes, it flares the skirt, the dimple of the ball, and it grips the bullet. It'll grip the rifling on the inside of the barrel and impart a spiral. It goes a lot farther and a lot more accurate with a tight spiral than it does end over end. In the Revolutionary War, they fired a round ball that just rattled down the end of a barrel and didn't hit anything. Oh, uh, the, like I said, the Frenchman's name was Manet. In in the South, a Manet bullet simply became a mini ball. So it's not small and it's not a bullet. I mean, it's not a ball. It's a it's a Manet bullet or a mini ball. Once you've once you've devastated the enemy ranks with your uh, with your gunfire, either through your volleys or whatever, you've, you've broken up the enemy formation. The enemy is vulnerable. They're staggered. Uh, the time has come to, to administer the coup d'etat, so to speak. When the soldiers marched, they went from place to place in a column of fours. They're in a battle line now, and they're getting ready to demonstrate, which would be the finality of the battle, the uh, bayonet charge. This way. <laughs> this is Hard times. I hadn't seen you ever seen you before. This is what they usually do when we well, come. That's what, that's what this is what they do when we come, but I guess with the cannon fella. Yeah. Oh, yeah, both officers are both here. Yeah. like a, a ninja or a karate guy shouting before he delivers a blow. It, it has a, does something to the innards. But uh, the rebel yell was unique. Uh, a lot of Yankees described it as hideous, horrible, sounded like banshees from hell or something like that. <laughs> Stonewall Jackson called it the sweetest music he'd ever heard. Uh, one Yankee soldier, soldier said that the effect that the rebel yell had on enemy soldiers was worth at least another division in battle. Y'all have any questions or whatever I could uh, answer? Yes, ma'am. What's the young boy's job besides picking up hats? He's a courier. <laughs> the officers can send him. Uh, with all this noise and going on in battle, they delivered orders, believe it or not, with drums, bugles. Little boys were used as couriers and things like that. The general was far in the back to find out what was going on would constantly be sending notes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Close enough to hear the drums or the bugles, different drum rolls meant different things, but he would also use young boys to run messages to the various outfits on the battlefield depending on how the course of the battle was going. As General Patton said in World War II, a battle plan is only good until the battle starts. Once the battle starts, you can throw the plans out the window. You can see a typical rebel army, you know two are dressed alike, but it's and as I was going to mention, the officers of both sides are setting class side by side at VMI and West Point, places like that. So basically, both sides are using the same almost identical tactics because their officers were classmates at West Point.
Of course, welcome to the McLean House. This house was originally built as the Rain Tavern or Rain Hotel back about 1848. And it was run by the Rain family for some years. But in about 1856, the building was abandoned. The family had died out or moved away. And it was abandoned for six years. Mr. McLean bought the house in 1862, moved his family into it the next year, 1863. The surrender took place here in April of 65. In 67, the family lost this house to the bank. They left here and they went back to Northern Virginia. They came, they stayed four years and they left. There's nobody in this county kin to the McLeans. When they left, the house was abandoned again for two years. Finally, a fellow from Baltimore, Maryland bought it and rented it out to a local family by the name of Raglan. The Raglans eventually bought the house. In 1888, Mr. Raglan died, and by the beginning of 1893, his wife had sold this house to a fellow from Niagara Falls, New York, by the name of Myron Dunlap. Mr. Dunlap and other investors had a get-rich-quick scheme. They hired a man from Appomattox by the name of C.W. Hancock to take this house apart, brick by brick, down to the foundation and stack it up here in the front yard, where they would then go and move it to Washington and rebuild it as a museum. But once it was stacked in the front yard, they went bankrupt. The house laid here in the front yard for 55 years and rotted away. Federal government opened bids for the reconstruction of this house in October 1947. The low bidder was C.W. Hancock and Sons, the same family that took it apart, rebuilt it 55 years later. But by laying out here in this yard for 55 years, everything rotted away. Structurally, the only thing original in this house is sitting on the original foundation and there are about 5,500 bricks. All of the bricks from that window around the front door over that window are original. And then I read the rest of the brick as they laid the brick around, about every 65th brick, they would stick an original in it. The house was open to the public in April 1949. It was dedicated April 1950. There were over 20,000 people here for that dedication. So remember when you go to the, into the McLean house, it was originally built as a haver, tavern. It was dismantled, laid in the front yard for 55 years, and rotted away. But this is structurally the McLean house, because before it was taken apart, Mr. Dunlap hired a man from Lynchburg to draw the plans to the house. Since he went bankrupt, he didn't pay that man. That family kept the plans, and the federal government was able to get those plans to rebuild this house. I'll hush up now.